Okay, let's get started and welcome again. Thanks for joining this webinar on therapeutics, therapeutic targets for dry AMD hosted by the Foundation Fighting Blindness. Our esteemed presenter this evening is Dr. David Boyer. He's a senior partner at Retina Vitria Associates Group in Southern California. And I am Ben Shaberman, VP of Science Communication at the Foundation Fighting Blindness. And we are delighted to bring you this informative and timely educational event. And this webinar is being sponsored by Apellus Pharmaceuticals. We'll have a short survey going out. It's only about eight questions, and we hope you will take a minute to complete the survey. That'll help us better design future uh, educational webinars. And in case you didn't know much about the Foundia Foundation Fighting Blindness, we are the global leader in funding research to treat and cure retinal conditions such as retinitis pigmentosa, Stargardt disease, Usher syndrome, and dry AMD. And we have a strong portfolio of 16 dry AMD related research grants. I also wanted to let you know that the foundation's professional outreach department is educating eye care professionals throughout the US about the many resources available for their retinal disease patients, including no cost genetic testing, no cost genetic counseling, our My Retina Tracker patient registry, there's extensive information about retinal diseases and emerging therapies and local chapters and communities throughout the U.S. And really the bottom line is the foundation, we at the foundation can help you provide hope and a path forward for your patients with these challenging conditions. And if you want to get in touch with the professional outreach department, you can contact my colleague, Michelle Glaze. She's director of professional outreach. You can reach her at mglaze at fightingblindness.org, or if you go to our homepage, fightingblindness.org, at the very top, you'll see a little tab called For Eye Care Professionals, and you can reach out to us through that as well. So at the end of the talk, we'll have time to answer some questions, so please feel free to enter those in the chat as we go along, and Dr. Boyle Boyer will answer them when he concludes. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Boyer. He's a board certified ophthalmologist specializing in the treatment of diseases of the retina and vitreous. Again, he is senior partner at Retina Vitreous Associates Medical Group in Southern California. He is also an adjunct clinical professor of ophthalmology with the University of Southern California Keck School of Medicine in Los Angeles. He has an extensive research background and is currently an investigator for various clinical trials. He's one of the leading retinal clinical researchers in the country for new treatments in macular degeneration and diabetic macular edema. A widely published author and avid lecturer, Dr. Boyer lectures nationally and internationally on retinal research and the innovative approaches to the treatment of retinal diseases. Dr. Boyer has relationships with most of the companies he will be mentioning in his talk. Now it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. David Boyer. And thank you very, very much. It's really a privilege and a pleasure to be here. On behalf of the organizers, it's my pleasure to, to speak to you about dry macular degeneration, the impact of diagnosis and treatments. Age-related macular degeneration um, is a growing problem. And as you can see from the bottom left um, graph, that as patients age, the incidence of prevalence of age-related macular degeneration increases dramatically. Everybody starts with macular degeneration early, the dry type, perhaps some small drusen, and we'll go through this later, or medium drusen. They go on later to intermediate macular degeneration, which are a little larger drusen and pigment alterations. And at that point, uh, about 15% of patients will go on to developing wet macular degeneration, 
But unfortunately, another 15% will going on to developing a form of dry macrogen called geographic atrophy. The risk, the 10-year risk of progression for the high-risk category of the ARID simple scale, which I'll go through later, is about over a little 50% and about 50% for wet also. Geographic atrophy is an advanced form of dry macro degeneration. About 85-90% of patients with AMD will develop the atrophic form of AMD, and about 30% of these will go on to GA. And patients with geographic atrophy develop dense irreversible scotomas, areas where they can't see. So if you look at this photograph, which is an autofluorescent image, the dark area in the center, surrounded by a little bit lighter, is the area of atrophy. And in that area, there are no rods and cones, so the patients have no vision. And if you look at the patients over the period of time in 2010, 2.1 million, 2030, 3.6, but by 2050, 5.4 million. So in the next 40 years, it's going to increase dramatically as we age in general. Severe vision loss occurs in about 15% of the patients with AMD. So there are a number of risk factors, some of which we can't really change. We can't change age. We know that it increases as patients get older. With gender, it seems to be higher and earlier onset in females. The race, higher incidence of Caucasians and African-Americans. And there are certainly hereditary factors, genetic predisposition. My mother had macular degeneration. She ended up having dry that went on to wet later in life. And my two sisters are both receiving injections at this time. But there are some systemic factors that you can alter. You can avoid smoking, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and poor nutrition. And there's also environmental factors, light exposure, especially to ultraviolet wavelengths. We all know about AREDS. It was a very large study. The AREDS uh, study was performed many years ago, and the AREDS 2 was a more recent study. And you're talking about 10,000 patients and we did notice that you could stop the advancement to advanced AMD, the formation of geographic atrophy centrally or wet macular degeneration by about 25%. But it's important to realize it didn't prevent geographic atrophy from forming or progressing. As I said, the risk factors, here you can see the females, almost 65% versus 35% of males. And increasing age, a 3.12 odds ratio, which means you're three times more likely to develop it as you get older, and smoking, and one almost a one and a half times risk that increases over the period of time. The global prevalence, as you can see on the bottom, again, another graph indicating how this occurs as we get older. So if you're greater than 90 years old, almost 22% of the patients will have some form of geographic atrophy. What can we do beyond the AREDS? Mediterranean diet has been shown to reduce formation and progression of AMD. Healthy diet, physical activity, and not smoking are associated with a 71% lower odds of developing macular degeneration. I always get asked the question, how about fish oil? Should I be taking fish oil? It was only found to be helpful in the patients not eating fish, the lowest dietary um, levels. Patients who uh, eat fish once a week or twice a week had no benefit from adding fish oil. We, we know a high fat diet, unfortunately, is associated with a very high prevalence of advanced AMD. And a low fat diet, whole grains, fruits, tomatoes, green leafy vegetables, dairy, fish, and seafood products are protective. Lutein and zeaxanthin are uniquely protective. And how they work is interesting. By taking lutein or zeaxanthin, these carotenoids, which you can get in a very small pill, about 20 milligrams of lutein with some zeaxanthin, it increases the pigment in your macula, which when light hits the, the macula area, it reduces the overall um, reactive oxygen species and the damage to the macula. So having lutein and zeaxanthin um, is found in the AREDS, but some people prefer to take it just without the AREDS formula. What else can you do? Well, we know that 30%, 32% increase in the risk of developing late AMD with obesity. The higher body fat lowers the uh, tissue levels of the zeaxanthin. Um, so it, it's important to try to keep a healthy diet and, and try to avoid obesity. Cardiovascular disease, the variable associated with several cardiovascular um, disease outcomes. 
MI, angina, and drusen and arterial sclerotic plaques have numerous components in common. We also know that diabetics uh, have a significantly greater risk of subsequent developing AMD, and patients with high cholesterol also have a, a increased risk. So these are things that you can try to manage for your patients or yourself to try to minimize the progression. What do patients experience? Well, I can tell you that patients, 50% of patients who have geographic atrophy said they did not feel confident driving during the day. And almost 90% said they did not feel confident driving at night. In addition, those patients with GA report a worsening of vision over the past year. And I see this constantly, even though we look and there's very little change in the size of the geographic atrophy, the patients tell you that they're getting worse every time that, that we see them, whether it be six months or a year, and that's compared to controls. There's simplified ARED staging. This is important for you to know. In category one, you may go see your doctor and he, you have just a couple of very small, fine punctate drusen, no pigment abnormalities, no signs of wet in either eye. You have a 0% chance of getting wet at five years. Those are called druplets, and they're probably a part of the normal aging change. But I see patients coming in constantly with small punctate drusen. Their risk of developing a problem over the next five, six, 10 years is very, very small. Intermediate drusen, less than 125 microns, mild pigment abnormalities, a 2% risk of developing wet at two years. Category three would be pigment alterations, large number of drusen. They have about an 18% risk of developing wet in five years. And certainly your risk goes way up if you have wet in one eye or advanced geographic atrophy in the other eye. And that would be a high risk category for advanced disease. How do we image it? Well, you can come in and we take a photograph and this is what they call fundus autofluorescence. And this area in the center that's black is the area that we can measure is the area of atrophy. We can also measure it, however, on photographs, color fundus photographs can also help us, though it's sometimes a little more difficult to pick out the exact boundaries of the areas when you look at a color photograph. Optical occurrence tomography, or OCT, is probably the best way of measuring this. And the reason is that with fundus autofluorescence, the foveal area itself is usually dark. So when you do your fundus autofluorescence, it's very hard to know, is it into the foveal area, is the atrophy into the foveal area, or is it outside the foveal area? And now you can look at an OCT and see where the fovea is, and you can actually determine exactly where it is. So in the top photograph under optical occurrence tomography on the right-hand side, the lesion is under the fovea, whereas in the, in the bottom one, it's off to the side, it's a little temporal, even though both lesions look very symmetrical when you look at them. So the OCT is probably a better way of being able to follow a lot of these patients. These are all non-invasive treatments. We don't have to do any um, injections of anything to come up with this diagnosis. Here we can follow this patient over a 30 month period. This patient had large semi-soft drusen, as you can see on the bottom uh, colored photographs and up above you can see on the OCT, this large elevation. It got a little bit worse and you can start to see that some of the elements were starting to get more pigment because it was getting a little higher. It was involving the pigment epithelium. And over the period of time, the mound went away, which some people would say, well, that's good. My mound went away, but it left the patient with geographic atrophy centrally and a loss of central vision. Reticular pseudodrusin is another category. Um, this is associated with atrophy also. It is important to diagnose this because there has been some recent studies that have shown that reticular pseudodrusin may be associated with um, heart disease. So it's important that you make that diagnosis, usually on a blue filter um, autofluorescence. Here you can see it looks like sawtooth pattern down below. These are very small um, drusenoid type changes that can progress. Here's another patient that you can see the progression. You can see in March of 2010, the upper left photograph basically looks pretty good. And in September of 2012, it doesn't look bad, but in May of 2014, you can see extensive areas of geographic atrophy. Now you can also see that the patient developed wet macular generation in March of 2010, 
and in September of 2012 had already developed significant pigment alterations. And in May of 2014, the pigment alterations have um, progressed and there's a large area of atrophy. Here's a color photograph. You can see in this color photograph that was taken, this is an area of GA that was measured at 5.33 millimeters squared. It's a very small area. And now you can see that it's grown to 8.23 millimeters squared. And you can see that the definitive shape, it's a presence of a circular shape, the presence of a sharp welding mercredit edge and depigmentation, diminished RPE pigment. There's some prognostic factors that are important to know, like what are the likelihood of GA progression? Number one is the larger baseline lesion size in the affected eye. Multifocal lesions progress faster. Perilesional FAF pattern, which I'll show you in a second, actually show the, a very quick way of looking to see if that patient's going to progress. And an extrafovea location. So once it's in the fovea, it tends not to grow as quickly. The extrafovea, the ones that are not dead center, tend to um, grow much quicker. Bilateral GA, a higher rate of progression in the fellow eye. So this is the perilesional patterns that are associated with geographic atrophy. These are all fundus autofluorescent lesions. If you look the, at the one on the left-hand side, over a period um, of years, this did not grow very much at all. In fact, it remained fairly quiescent. And if you look at the focal, there was just a little bit of change but not a lot of change. But if you look at the area of atrophy and look at the surrounding area of white around it, that would be called banded, it's all the way around. And you compare that to the one that has diffuse changes all the way around, that one's gonna progress much more rapidly. So if you were doing a study and you wanted to see if your drug worked, you probably wanna go with the banded or diffuse because they progress much quicker than if you look at this focal or the ones that don't have any progression. And many times those represent something else totally and are not really associated with, with age-related geographic atrophy. Everybody wants to know about the genetics. Um, in AMD, there are two risk alleles, uh, complement factor H and the ARMS2. They're independently associated with complement activation. We know there are 40 loci in, implicated and account for about only 50% of the risk. The complement components of complement factor H, CFI, C3, C9, C2, are all variants predicted to increase activation or decrease inactivation of the complement cascade. And we'll go through that when we go on to treatment. So there are several emerging strategies for dry macular generation. We've had neuroprotection, reduced toxic byproducts, visual cycle modulation, stem cells, and suppressing inflammation in others. Neuroprotection is very difficult to obtain, there are several companies that have tried this. Um, Celery neurotrophic growth factors was one of the first. It did not prove to be beneficial, beneficial for geographic atrophy, but may be the holy grail for uh, patients with idiopathic paraphobial telangiectasias type 2. Um, mitochondrial treatments such as stealth and integrins are somewhat neuroprotective. They work on the mitochondria and are going to be beneficial. Repairing mitochondria has become very interesting. We know that over the period of time, as we get older, mitochondria are your energy cells. And I don't think there's anybody that would argue in the audience that when you get to be 60 years of age or older, you don't have the energy you did when you were 30. And, and part of that has to do with the mitochondria dysfunction that you get as we get older in general. But if you look at the patients who have AMD, the age-related macular degeneration, they lose mitochondria faster than the average person just based upon age alone. And there's several companies now looking at treatment of mitochondria in various ways to try to um, improve the uh, quality of the mitochondria so that they keep the energy production and hopefully will make them see better at night, this low luminance vision that we spoke about earlier, and also prevent progression. Here um, in one study, uh, uh, lamipertide uh, was a subcutaneous injection. And they found that if you had uh, good areas of easy zone, that's the, the rods and cones were still left to some degree, that you developed a very big improvement in the vision. There was a significant visual gain. But if you look at this 
wherever it's magenta, it um, is no easy zone. There's no rods and cones in that area. So there's no way you're going to get an improvement. And the one that gained four letters, you had some blue there, which indicates some functioning uh, areas of rods and cones. But if you look at the one that had the green and just the surrounding area of uh, the magenta, this is um, these are the ones that gained a lot of vision. Integrins are another um, area that's been studied. There are a number of integrins that are um, being tested. A lot of people think they've never heard of integrins, but um, integrins are used uh, topically um, for uh, treatment of dry eye. Um, and the integrins have been shown to help um, differentiate um, migration, inflammatory responses, plate aggregation, repairing cells. And they've been shown to actually improve um, vision in a, a group of patients. So here they had a phase two trial. And um, at baseline, they had these patients who had drusen and had decreased vision. They found that after 12 weeks of treatment, there were eight letters gained. Um, versus um, uh, seven percent and forty-eight percent of patients receiving the drug, versus seven percent in the placebo. That's also showing that the visual field centrally was also improved, um, and this continued on for a certain period of time. Though this drug may not be going forward, there um, are um, other companies that are looking at, at adding this into um, their their drug to have an additional effect. There are a number of companies that looked at reducing byproduct accumulation. Um, there are um, areas of amyloid uh, oligomers in the retina. We know that I was involved in a project that did look at, uh, and it's still involved in another project, that's looking at being able to diagnose Alzheimer's disease based upon retinal scans after the administration of, of either an oral medication or an intravenous medication. And we know that, that amyloid is present in drusen, and though we don't think that it's probably the cause of, of the macular degeneration, it may be the inciting uh, agent that causes the progression of the complement pathway. And here just shows this is beta amyloid found in Drusen. Alkius was uh, trying to reduce the um, visual cycle um, progression to try to reduce the progression. It did not work, but, but it is being tried in Stargardt's disease in early star guards. Everybody comes in and wants to know about stem cells and there are all kinds of stem cells. Most of the stem cells that we're talking about are stem cells that will improve the um, milieu within the eye and not be reparative. Um, there are a couple of studies that, that we've been involved in that do show some improvement. One of them was a, a treatment uh, CNTO2476 human umbilical tissue derived cells. There were patients that did get an improvement of vision, a 10 letter improvement, but um, there are unfortunately significant uh, risks to this. The rate of retinal perforation was 35%, detachment 17%. And because of these, um, the additional phase 2A study was uh, discarded. There is a custom subretinal delivery system that had been um, I've used in the past that will um, hopefully resolve some of those problems. Um, but again, this is very early and um, it is, is being tested only in a phase one trial. There are a number of uh, comp uh, complement inhibitors that were designed to suppress inflammation. We feel that inflammation plays a major role in the formation and the progression. But you can look on the left and there's an, another um, group of patients that, that didn't get better on this. But we're gonna go through these. Here's the classical pathway, the lecticum pathway and the alternative pathway. The, the classical lecticum and alternative pathways really are um, ways that we protect ourselves. The classical pathway, if you get a cold or if you, you know, get sick, the classical pathway tries to stop that. If you get a skin infection, electricum pathway, and the alternative pathway tries to prevent you from viruses and internal type of changes. And most of the work today is being done in the alternative pathway, trying to reduce the activation of the complement system. Why? Because once it's activated, it, it continues on and destroys the cells. 
And the, unfortunately, the cells that it's destroying are, are the cells at the edge of the geographic atrophy. So the ge geographic atrophy continues to grow. So these all, the, every circle here has a, has a drug that's trying to look at treatment. The first one we're going to talk about is the only one in the classical pathway. It's C1Q ANX007. It is um, it really binds to CRP, which is um, found on drusen and is part of the inflammatory pathway. And by binding to the drusen, it can reduce the inflammation at, uh, and also works on synapses. And lo and behold, when the study was done, it was the first complement therapy to preserve visual acuity and achieve statistical significant protection against visual loss in both foveal and non-foveal patients through 12 months. The reduction rate of geographic atrophy did not reach statistical uh, significance, which was their original primary endpoint, but it's neuroprotective, protecting photoreceptors, synapses, and function. Here in this study, you can see that in the sham group, 20.3% um, of the patients lost three lines of vision, which is significant, mo called moderate visual loss, but it's significant visual loss. Whereas if you look at the every month or every other month, it was cut in half. And this, this study is going to go forward. This is the type of result we want to see that we can preserve vision. And there was a 72% reduction in risk of 15 letter loss, which as I'll show you through other um, slides today, is unfortunately what happens with geographic atrophy. The next uh, drug we'll talk about is danocapin. Um, this has an effect on factor D. Um, it's a small molecule, it's administered orally. We did have a very large trial that failed um, that did use factor D. Um, this one hopefully is getting a higher concentration where it's supposed to be. But in the first trial, there was no effect with intravitreal um, administration of something to block factor D. This decreases the complement activation, trying to reduce all the way down to the MAC complex, which is the last uh, enzyme that's activated that will cause a breakdown and a loss of the cells. GM103 by Gemini, um, associated with inflammation dysfunction, again, um, trying to reduce the um, inflammation and dysfunction by having a full length or, uh, recombinant factor H protein. Um, it's safe, but this has been studied before and did not show long-term effects. We'll see if this study can show that. Ionis is again, uh, way up in the alternative pathway. It's a it's really trying to reduce factor B. And by reducing factor B, again, you're targeting this to um, reduce the formation of the MAC complex. You're trying to reduce the uh, complement pathway from proceeding and causing cell loss. Factor um, I was a, a gene therapy that Novartis was doing. It was an AAV2-based gene therapy. It was delivered under the retina by a special device called the Orbit device. And it was aimed to restore the balance to an overactive complement system by increasing CFI. And the CFI regulates the activity of the complement system and increasing production could reduce inflammation. It failed and the study has been halted. So that brings us to two new treatments that have both been approved. The first one that was FDA approved was pegacetacoplum by Apellus. And um, it showed uh, the ability to um, stop C3 from breaking down. You can see that C3 and C5, which are components in the complement system, that all three of the complement pathway, the classical, the alternative, and lecticon, all come together at C3 and then at C5. The study included 1,258 enrolled patients randomized to receive the pegacetacoplin 15 milligrams in one-tenth of an ml monthly or every other month versus sham. And the primary endpoint was 12 months, but the study continued up to 24 months and is now in 30 months, showing phenomenal results as you continue onward. Here's where it breaks down. You can see all three of these pathways merge at C3 and C3B, um, and they break down and then eventually cause cell lysis when it goes on to the MAC complex. So pegacetacoplin blocks C3, C3B, 
from going on to um, breaking down the C5. It was a standard inclusion. These are patients who um, could have subphobial or, or extraphobial lesions. The lesions um, had to have the, the presence of the perilesional hyper autofluorescence that we talked about. The ones that, that had the banded or the diffuse were the ones that they wanted to put in here. And here, to give you an example, this is a non-subphobial area of geographic atrophy that surrounds the fovea. And the left-hand side of the screen and the right hand, there's subphobial. And you can see that about 65% of the patients in Oaks and Derby population were subphobial. Here, the 24-month data, you can see that from the very beginning, um, there was very not very much separation. The slope appeared to be showing an improvement. However, um, the, the slope really started to show a bigger improvement from 18 to 24 months. The top gray line is the natural history, what, what happens without treatment. And then you can see the two lines, the every other month or the monthly. And you can see that that was in the Derby trial and the Oaks trial. And for sake of completeness, the Oaks trial met its primary uh, statistical significant endpoint at 12 months. Derby uh, did not meet it, but as you continued out, you could see a definite difference and you can see a definite improvement with 19% of the monthly in one trial and 22% of the monthly in the other trial getting a reduction and 16% in the other uh, every other month or 18% in the OAKS. So very statistically meaningful. And if you go to 30 months, the line continues to show growth in the sham group and is really attenuated in the group that's getting treatment. What does this mean? It means you're really slowing down. You're not stopping, but you are slowing down the growth of these lesions. Here, you can see what I spoke about earlier, non-subfovial. Those were lesions that were um, more rapidly growing. You had almost a 26% monthly at 24 months and 22% every other month. When it was subfovial, the numbers went down because as, as I told you, subfovial don't grow as quickly, 90% monthly and 16% every other month. Here's the problem. The problem is the best corrected vision over 24 months in combined, and, and we'll talk about that in a second, still showed a deterioration of vision. Now, there was no real significant difference across the study arms. However, if you did take lesions that were greater than 250 microns away from the fovea, you could get another line of vision at the end of two years versus the patients who were not treated. So it's treating earlier is much more important. It's very important if you can catch these patients before they become centrally involved. Safety, there were patients at 24 months, uh, approximately 12% of patients did go on to developing um, what we call exudative disease or choroidal devascularization, which required additional treatment. Infectious endophthalmitis occurs with any injection. Interocular inflammation was low and there were no events of retinal vasculitis or retinal vein occlusion with 24,000 injections uh, done in the 24-month uh, study. Since that time, there were um, eight patients, possibly up to nine at this point, that did develop a form of vasculitis, and uh, some patients, about half of them, lost vision. Um, and it was felt to be possibly secondary to um, something that was occurring at the time of the injection, not the disease itself. The company underwent a vigorous um, uh, look and they found that perhaps the uh, injection needles were not quite what um, they had had in the study. They changed them back and there has been virtually no other cases and there's been another uh, probably close to 70, 80,000 injections given. Here's an exudative. This is uh, the patient showing just the baseline. And then um, the patient showed some leakage, the little black areas and then was treated with the anti-VEGF and went on and could be followed. There was another C3 inhibitor, NGM621. Um, this did not show um, an improvement. This is again a C3 complement inhibitor, but when it was tested, it's a little different. Um, one is pegylated and um, one was a monoclonal, a monoclonal antibody, and there may not have been enough medicine in NGM to really get a great response. Advanced captive pegol um, by Iverica Bio it, it blocks C5, right below C3. 
um, is C5. Again, it's found in all um, three pathways, classical, alternative, and lectithin. They all meet at C3. And then C, uh, C5 convertase is activated and the advanced captive pegol blocks it, stopping the inflammasome and membrane complex. And it's an inhibition slows inflammation and cell death. It's a pegylated RNA aptamer and a potent specific inhibitor of complement C5. Its inhibition uh, of this critical step in the complement cascade prevents the formation of C5A and C5B and it doesn't matter what activated it. So that becomes very important Though we still feel the alternative pathway um, does have probably the, the biggest chance of um, activation. It was well tolerated 12 months. They had excellent safety, no um, advanced captopegol related adverse events. There were no serious AEs, no cases of endophthalmitis. Here you see curves very similar to what you saw previously and the difference showed, um, and these, the one thing I should mention is in this study, all the patients had to be uh, extraphobial. There were no subphobial lesions. So when you look at this, you have to realize that you have to go back to the 25, 20 some percent in the other study just to realize the difference. Because if you look at the combined, they're, they're much less with the C3 inhibitor. And, but again, if you go back only to the ones that were extraphobial, these are very similar curves. And here's just the, uh, another curve. So there were two studies, the GATHER-1, which um, was much smaller. The GATHER-2 had 225 patients and 222 sham. And the second year, um, they were divided in half. So approximately 112 in each arm would go either monthly or every other month versus the sham. And here's the results. The GATHER-2 was not quite as good. GATHER-1 was we had a bigger response, very similar to what we saw when we looked at the um, C3 inhibition, you know, the Oaks compared to Derby, Oaks looked much better than Derby. These are individual changes that sometimes we really can't describe the reason for it, but this is the reason that the FDA requires two separate studies whenever you're trying to get a drug approved. And here the slope analysis again shows that the treatment did reduce progression over the period of time. There was no one group that benefited. In other words, sometimes you look at a study and find that all the patients who had one specific type of geographic atrophy were the ones that really pulled the results. Here we can say honestly that at 12 and 18 months, not one group favored, they all favored the treatment group as far as uh, reducing progression. And here's the primary analysis again with a high degree of statistical significance. Their safety was excellent. They did have the exudative changes. Um, this was 12 months. I, I told you 12% at 24 uh, months. This will go up when we get the 24 month data. And, um, but the instance of CNV was, was a little bit lower in this group. These were the patients. Not everybody got treated. If they had extra phobial, you can see where the green showed where they would get treatment and the red would be outside this 1500 micron or if it was subphobial, they would not treat it. The last um, drug that I'm gonna discuss in the complement pathway is HMR-59 by Himera. It's a very interesting drug. Uh, I've told you the me membrane attack complex is what the end result is. And the membrane attack complex uh, uh, combines with C5, C6, C7, C8, combines with C9 to form a cell membrane pore, which actually destroys the cell. And in our body, we have a naturally occurring human protein called CD59. CD59 um, is, it will stop neovascularization, also stops VEGF. And this drug has been used, this is a gene therapy with one injection, they've been able to show both a reduction in growth as well as a reduction in wet macular generation. So it's very interesting that this drug may play a role for both. This may be something that we'll have to see in the future, but it's an intervitreal injection of the CD59. And in AMD, the CD59 goes down and the MAC complex goes up. And if you increase CD59, the MAC complex goes down. There are a lot of questions that we don't know. We don't know 
what is the complement activation, what causes it, the pathway involved. Here I showed you classic when we went there and, and it shows very good results. Is it lifelong or uh, just over reactivity in the beginning? What are the risks of inhibition for long-term and where should we block? There are a number of other approaches and for time, I don't have a chance to talk about all of them. I've been involved in some of these, HRA1 inhibition, inflammasome inhibition. These are should try to reduce the inflammatory component. Optogenetics is something that was uh, the foundation fighting blindness has been very actively involved in because this takes cells that no longer can see. These are your rods and cones are gone. This is something that's used a lot for retinitis pigmentosa patients, but may be used for geriatric atrophy. It's being used for Stargardt's with one of the companies. And what happens is that they take cells, when, the, when you lose your, your cones and your rods, those are the cells that activate and allow you to, to see. If they're gone, you don't have any photoreceptors. But what they do with optogenetics is they can activate other cells, bipolar cells or ganglion cells. They become like rods and cones. They become cells that will see light and be able to transmit uh, an image. The results have been pretty amazing. I mean, you've taken, I've seen this where they take patients who are completely blind, no light perception, and allow them to see light by doing this and other patients who have increased um, ability to, to navigate. Obviously for dry AMD, it um, has to come a long way before, but for retinitis pigmentosa, it is something on the horizon. Macrophage manipulation, um, doxycycline and minicycline. Um, unfortunately, the uh, TOGA trial did not show an improvement. Zydenafil has been used, MC1101, which is a drug to increase blood flow, high dose statins. And here's a, a patient who had large uh, areas of using with pigment alterations. And then with high dose statins, it actually went away. This study has not been uh, carried on further. It's very difficult for people to take large doses of statins. The last thing I'm gonna talk about is photomodulation. This is something that we do have results, two year results on. It's uh, three wavelengths of light that are used in a non-invasive way to try to remove cellular deposits and inhibit VEGF expression, stimulate metabolic activity, try to Im improve mitochondria. And you can see here the top line data at month 13 showed that patients with um, getting this treatment, this three colored wavelength treatment, did have an improvement of vision over the um, sham group. You can also see that the ERG was improved in these patients, showing that this is really a biological response. And I'll end with this last patient who had drusen, and after treatment, the drusen went away. There, we're starting the third year of this trial in our office, um, and this is not available. It is available in Europe under C mark, but I wouldn't recommend you go to Europe at this time. Thank you very, very much. Ben, Dr. Boyer, for that awesome talk, you covered an incredible amount of ground so clearly and concisely. Thank you. Um, we're opening it up for questions. I want to ask a question to get things going, and that's about compliance with the new FDA-approved therapies, getting your patients, even before they have significant vision loss, to... Um, to take the new therapies. And can you talk about what you're saying to your patients about um, why these newer approaches are so important? Well, Ben, you bring up the, probably the number one question. The patients who will benefit the most are patients with good vision. And this is not one shot and done. We know that in the, um, the Pellis trials, the C3 trials, um, they, tr they treated at four weeks and then they treated at eight weeks. And you're talking about over 1,500 patients involved in these trials. And those patients who were extraphobial did very, very well. But it's hard to explain to someone, it's sort of very similar to um, treating for glaucoma. You know, the patients come in after six months of being on the drop and say, I don't see any difference. And you know you say good because that's what you want to see is no difference. 
So I explained to everybody, this is a journey and you need to, this journey is going to be for a long period of time. We don't have anything that lasts longer at this moment, but hopefully all these, all these companies are looking at longer acting delivery. We're looking at better ways of, of delivering, possibly oral, possibly even um, in gene therapy. But the truth of the matter is, if we can keep you from losing vision now, then you'll be able to keep more vision down the road. Um, it's it's difficult. People will get tired of getting these shots. You can give them anywhere from four to eight weeks, whereas um, using the Iveric data, at least at this time, we only have a four-week approval. We don't have anything above that. Now, some people say, well, I'll treat them at six weeks. We have no data to support a six-week you know, trial. We don't have the two-month. Now, perhaps at this coming retina meeting that I'm going to next week, perhaps they'll share some information that might change my mind. But this is a, this is not a wowy drug, you know. This is not like you know the first time that I ever gave a patient a shot of a anti vegf drug and they suddenly could see and I could see the effect that it had on them. I call those wowy drugs. This is not a wowy drug. You have to be in it for the long haul and understand we're just trying to slow down the redu uh, reduce the visual decrease that you're getting from your disease. Right. Right. Well, thanks for sharing that perspective and what you say to patients. And sort of related to that, there are a lot of clinical trials underway. And how do you decide who to, and when I say who, I mean patients, who to talk to about clinical trials and who to suggest a potential therapy to? So that that's a, a, an outstanding question because whenever it's, it was easy in the beginning. We had a huge clinical trials unit and um, there weren't a lot of choices. So, I mean, it was very easy to enroll in a clinical trial when, when you had benefit, potential benefit and, and no downside. I, I, I really look at the safety that the companies have done up till when they bring it to, to um, the clinic. Um, I look at, you know, sometimes the, the phase... I used to do phase one trials. I, I do mostly phase two and phase three trials now. Um, but I think that, you know, if you have bilateral disease and you don't want a shot and somebody has an oral medication that may be efficacious for you, as long as it's safe um, or a subcutaneous injection as will be coming out very shortly um, in the stealth trial where you're treating the mitochondria, um, I think those patients would be amenable to treating both eyes at the same time with a, an alternative method rather than getting shots in both eyes every four to eight weeks. So I think that it really depends on the patient. Um, certainly, I, I'm, I'm somewhat reluctant to take a patient that um, would be a good candidate. You know, best candidate would be geographic atrophy in one eye and um, extra foveal GA in the other eye. I probably wouldn't put that patient in a clinical trial. I would continue to treat him with standard of care. Um, so it's really gonna depend on what comes out. There's a new drug that I did not put in here that I'm advisor for um, that is showing some, some very significant improvements, but in a small number. And I'm waiting for the number to increase before I can turn around to someone and say, well, this one seemed to show a little better improvement. I think it's worthwhile for you to get into this trial. Right, right. Thank you again for that great response. And I have another really easy question for you. <laughs> I say a little facetiously. You mentioned um, as your talk went along about some therapies that did show some effect in clinical trials, but ultimately the, the trials failed. What do you think we learned from those trials in terms of approaches or trial design for future therapies? Well, you know, when we design a trial today, we, we have to, you know, look back at, at why do we fail? You know, why did it, why did factor D when Genentech did the trial, why did factor D fail? And, you know, you can ask yourself different, you know, you, you have to review this and be honest with yourself. Number one, in the phase two trial, it really didn't have a statistical significant improvement. So the real question is, why did they do a phase three if it really didn't show that great of an improvement in a phase two? 
you have to ask yourself, did it fail because the drug wasn't getting to the target or there just wasn't enough drug there? Or was the drug just going to be ineffective no matter where you placed it? And I think that, you know, everybody who does clinical trials today and every company wants the answers done one time. They want to be able to go in and they want to be able to say, um, I want the answer. I want to take patients who have good vision and I want to find out, can I make them better, et cetera. And those days are over. I mean, the, you know, but the, the companies keep pushing for that because they'd like the answers very, very quickly. Um, I think you have to go slow. You, you, look at, you look at your phase one trial to find safety and perhaps a dose. Phase two, you're getting a little bit more information. So you can do a phase three to see if it's worthwhile doing a phase three. And if you follow that, you know, co certain companies have jumped from phase two or phase one to phase three, trying to bypass everything. And it, usually it's because of money and time. Um, but the companies that have followed and, and have gone through, um, a, a good example is the C3 inhibitor by Apellus. They did the Philly study and got phenomenal phase two results. We were all anxious to see and hopefully duplicate the same results, a very well-run trial. And we learned a lot from that trial and we learned which patients we want. I, you know, if I put together a trial today, from what I told you on, on this webinar, I would want patients that are extraphobial because they go faster. I'd want, you know, I, I'd want patients who have a certain type of autofluorescent pattern. I, you know, those are all, all things. Maybe I want patients with low luminance deficits. In other words, when the light's dim, they can't see as well as with the lights on. So we've learned a lot. And we've learned that, you know, looking at the, um, what they call the easy zone, the, the, the rods and cone layer of your retina can give you answers that we never had before. And then some of this work is being done out of the cold eye clinic that has, you know, r really shown us why certain patients and certain groups get better. Um, so I think we've learned a lot. Um, one of the questions on the chat was, how do you pick one drug versus another when they're both out there? I, you know, you've got, you know, you have to look at the number of patients that were involved in the clinical trials. That helps me feel more comfortable. I like to look at two-year results because we're not dealing with a one-and-done treatment. We're dealing with a long-term treatment. And, you know, I also need to know how, how long can I go between these and make a decision? It's not conceivable for most people to come in monthly. So if I have to have a patient come in monthly, that, and another drug will work perhaps slightly less well, but, but still works fairly well at eight weeks. I, I would personally, if I had to take it, I'd do the eight week drug. I also, you know, need to know the long-term, um, the long-term results, you know, I'm, I'm happy to see that the C3 is now 30 months out. Um, I wasn't happy to, to see, and I did have a pause when suddenly we had these patients who unfortunately developed um, severe inflammation in the eye and vaso-occlusive disease. I put a lot of patients on pause till they discovered what the cause was. But it is a difficult decision. It's a difficult um, time to speak to them. They're, both drugs may work very, very well. I just want to see additional information before I get involved with a C5 inhibitor. Sure, sure. Thanks for that thoughtful um, answer on, on again, a, a tough question. So for both really wet AMD and dry AMD, the treatments we have right now are for later stage disease for the most part. At least for dry AMD, what do you see as an opportunity to prevent vision loss from ever happening or really slowing down uh, the time when it might occur? Well, Ben, you know, that, that's the Holy grail. If you can stop, you know, if you, if you can take a patient and either modify the genetics in some manner so that they don't progress. And there is a company now looking at that to try to, you know, to reduce, there, there are certain genes that certainly have been associated with a uh, progression and for the formation of GA and, and also for, for neovascularization. And what they're doing is there are certain genes that most people don't speak about, but actually are protective genes. And 
what they're doing is they're doing and putting protective genes in with the idea that the protective genes may be stronger than the other genes and they may be able to slow down the process. If you're going to treat earlier, you're going to have to treat something way up in the in the chain. And it could be inflammasomes, it could be mitochondria, it could be macrophages. You may be able to modify macrophages early, but you need to have some long-term delivery system. It's inconceivable that you can take a patient with 20, 25, 20, 30 vision, these large semi-soft drusen that has good vision and be able to um, treat them monthly. They're not going to come in. They're going to get, you know, treatment burnout. Um, I'm already seeing that in some patients that, that you know, started treatment. They were very anxious to get treatment and are starting to burn out at this time. But I think that, you know, mitochondria um, is one, inflammasomes are another, and I think macrophages are all way up to try to avoid the complement system from being activated. Um, once they're in the complement system, I think you're going to be limited to 25, 30% reduction, 35% reduction. But you know what you're bringing up is the holy grail. If you can treat earlier before the vision loss and prevent this from occurring, that's what we'd like to do. Yeah, interesting. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on that. And then the other challenge associated with treating early is coming up with the endpoint or the biomarker uh, for your clinical trial. That's true, you know, and and that's why I showed you the integrin. The integrin actually was um, was really uh, um, very very interesting um, because all of us said, well, these patients have to have some other reason. They have to have a cataract, or they have to have some other reason that they're having a problem. And the truth of the matter was, no, they don't. Um, we looked at the carefully at the EZ zone, this rods and cone layer that um, Justice Ellers at, at Cole Eye Clinic did an extensive evaluation and was able to pick out patients who were going to benefit. So I think with better imaging, we're gonna be able to come up with endpoints. And, and the FDA, why the Chambers has said that if you can reduce cell loss, if you can reduce, you know, reduction in the EZ zone, even though their vision may remain, he will take that as, as a um, endpoint. Um, but you're right, coming up with an endpoint when you start with 2020 vision is somewhat difficult. You want to keep them at 2020. Right, right. Well, Dr. Boyer, we are just about at the top of the hour, and I want to Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Um, again, you covered a lot of ground very clearly and uh, very insightfully. So thank you for your time and thanks for the wonderful work you're doing for your patients and on the clinical trial front lines. I also wanna thank Apellis again for being a, a sponsor for this webinar. I want to encourage attendees to take the survey that'll be coming out. It's just take questions. That'll help us design future webinars. And thanks to everyone for attending. Um, we appreciate you taking time out of your evening or afternoon or wherever you are to join us to learn about uh, what's happening in dry AMD therapeutics and learn a little bit about the foundation fighting blindness. Um, Dr. Boyer, again, thank you for an awesome. Oh, thank awesome you very much talk. for having me. My pleasure. Have a great rest of your day or evening, everyone. Bye-bye.